Welcome. Good evening. I'm Persis Drell, the provost of Stanford University, and I am here on behalf of myself and President Tessier Levine to welcome you to Cardinal Conversations. Last fall, Mark and I asked several university thought leaders in conjunction with student leaders to organize a series of discussions. We asked that these discussions advance two commitments at the heart of Stanford's research and education mission. Our commitment to the free expression of ideas and our commitment to fostering an inclusive campus culture. The students and thought leaders were asked to decide the format of the events, the discussion topics, and the guest speakers. And in just a few moments, you will see their collaboration bear fruit. So tonight, I'm pleased to welcome you to the first event in this new discussion series. The initiative is very important to both me and to Mark, so important that we're actually doing a balancing act to participate. I normally teach a physics class from 6.30 to 8.30 on Wednesday night. Mark is currently teaching my physics class for me. <laughs> He's an a undergraduate physics degree. Um, so I can inaugurate the series. After my remarks, I will return to my classroom and Mark will join you for the conversation. In a few minutes, Mike McFall, the head of Freeman Spogli Institute, will describe how he and Neil Ferguson of Hoover convened a group of students and worked together with them to initiate this series. And he'll describe their plans moving forward. Then Neil will moderate a discussion on the topic of technology and politics between well-known entrepreneurs and Stanford alumni, Reid Hoffman and Peter Thiel. So I have to start by thanking Mike, Neil, and the student leaders from a broad range of organizations across the political spectrum for putting together the series. And I have to thank Reed and Peter, of course, for agreeing to be our first Cardinal Conversations participants. And I know everyone here is eager to hear their thoughts. The goal of Cardinal Conversations is to encourage the free expression of diverse viewpoints, to stimulate critical thinking by considering opinions beyond our own, and to engage in civil and intellectually rigorous conversation. So why is this initiative such an important priority for Mark and myself? Well, first, we believe that in both research and education, breakthroughs in understanding come not from considering familiar, limited ranges of ideas, but from, con from considering a broad range of ideas, including those we might find objectionable and engaging in rigorous testing of them through analysis conversations and debate. Second, our strength at Stanford derives from our diversity. Diversity of backgrounds, religions, nationalities, races, genders, sexual identities, ages, physical abilities, political views, and ways of thinking. We are only successful as an intellectual community when our discussion benefits from the entire range of diverse per perspectives present on our campus. And finally, we feel it's the responsibility of all of us, not just that we ensure that the expression of a diversity of views is not just a possibility, but we also work to make it a reality at Stanford, both in the classroom and outside of it. And one way to do that is to ensure that diverse perspectives are actually discussed at Stanford. So it is in this spirit that tonight's conversation we hope, the, and Carnival's conversations to come, will help open all of our minds to diverse opinions, and that we will all commit to intellectually rigorous and respectful dialogue across differences, whether in the classroom, in the dorm, or in social media, whether as a student, a scholar, or a citizen of the world. As you are all aware, we cannot mandate respectful disagreement but we can model it and we can encourage it. And I thank you all for being here tonight as ambassadors of that cause. Thank you very much. And I would now like Mike McFall to come up and make some remarks. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm Mike McFall. I'm the director of the Freeman Spogli Institute, professor of political science and senior fellow here at the Hoover Institution. It's fantastic to see so many people here tonight. Uh, I, 
you call it thought leader, uh, uh, Provost Straw? I don't know if I'm a thought leader, but I am a professor and I am an advisor to Cardinal Conversations, and it's a real thrill and privilege to do that. Um, I want to say three points to add to what our provost just said. Uh, first, I want to congratulate the students um, and the faculty members for the idea for this program and to thank President Tessier Levine and Provost Drell for embracing and supporting this novel idea. We have thousands of speakers at Stanford all the time. Sometimes I feel like all I do is provide entertainment uh, for people over at FSI and sometimes here at Hoover. We have secretaries of state, we have national security advisors. In my field, I work on international security. We have ambassadors, we have senators, we've had presidential candidates. She came twice, actually, to Stanford. Uh, and we've had presidents. President George W. Bush has been here twice just in the last couple of years. And President Obama has been here twice in the last couple of years. In fact, I'm working on bringing him for a third time. Imagine Obama unhinged. But he promised me. Let's see if he, he holds true on that. But there's something significantly different, two things significantly different about what we're trying to do here tonight. First, in a somewhat dangerous experiment, we are pairing speakers together, not just giving them a podium alone and not just giving a podium with a safe interlocutor like I have done with some of those other people. We have Neil Ferguson today to moderate. And second, students are at the forefront of what we're doing here, at least as far as I'm concerned, considering the topics, the speakers, and also the participation. It is fantastic to see so many students in this room today. Probably more students are in this room today than ever before. That's exactly what we want. Second point. Cardinal conversation is an experiment. In the vernacular of tonight, it's a startup. As such, it's an imperfect product, and we want to improve it in the future. I'm excited about some of the speakers we've lined up already. Anne Applebaum, Christina Summers, Cornell West, he just confirmed, Wendy Sherman, Fareed Zakaria, and many others. But as we move forward, we want to increase the diversity of speakers, perspectives, and topics including in the fall, from my point of view, more attention to foreign policy and international issues. And then third and finally, the best way to increase that diversity is to have more of you involved in that, both faculty members here tonight, but also more students. So I encourage you to send you us your ideas. I encourage you to join our little committee. Uh, I encourage you to be engaged and help to form Cardinal Conversation as we move forward. It's a pretty good product right now, but it's going to be better if you engage with us. But if you're going to launch a product, I've been told, sitting in the back with some folks who have done that and in ways that I have not, you should start with a big bang. You should start with a fantastic program, and that's exactly what we have tonight. So let me now turn it over to my colleague, Neil Ferguson, and introduce our fantastic conversationalist and get this program started. Thank you all for coming. The wind of freedom blows, is Stanford's motto, die Lüfte Freiheit weht. Uh, it's on the tree or above the tree in the university's seal. And I think Cardinal Conversations is all about letting that wind of freedom blow. In establishing this series of conversations to affirm this university's commitment to free speech, we, that's Mike McFall and myself, along with the eight-member student steering committee, we're all agreed that we wanted high-profile public intellectuals, not politicians uh, and not professional provocateurs. Tonight, as we launch Cardinal Conversations, we're extraordinarily fortunate to have two of Stanford's most successful alumni ever. But both men are public intellectuals only as a hobby, which is rather annoying, uh, for those of us who do it for a living, because their day jobs, as you probably are aware, are being technology entrepreneurs and investors. I, I'm, I'm not sure they need an introduction to this audience, but I'll do it anyway. Reid Hoffman on my left and your right is the co-founder of 
LinkedIn, a professional network that you will be on if you're not already, and a partner at Greylock Partners. He's currently on the boards of Airbnb, Modo, Convoy, Blockstream, I could go on, Mozilla Corporation. He's also the host of Masters of Scale, a podcast series which I highly recommend and which actually gave me the idea for this uh, opening event. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a really extraordinarily good introduction to the world of, of technology entrepreneurship. And he's got a book coming out, uh, not his first, because there's already the startup of you and the alliance. The new book focuses on what Reed calls blitz scaling, uh, based on the Stanford course that went by that name. Uh, he has, in addition, a master's degree in philosophy from Oxford, my old university, where he was a Marshall Scholar. Uh, but here he was a major, he has a bachelor's degree with distinction in symbolic systems. Uh, on my right and your left, Peter Thiel, uh, started PayPal along with Reed. They were once on the same team uh, <laughs> back in the 1990s. Peter led PayPal as chief executive officer, took it public in 2002. In 2004, as you doubtless know from the movie The Social Network, he made the first outside investment in a little Harvard company called Facebook, uh, and he's still a director of that company. That same year, he launched Palantir Technologies, He's a, a partner at Founders Fund, uh, which is the venture capital firm uh, that funded such companies as SpaceX and Airbnb. Peter also started the Teal Fellowship, which encourages young people like many of you to put, as he uh, says, learning before schooling. Uh, he's another author, uh, which is maddening to those of us who only write books. Uh, his book, Zero to One Notes on Startups, uh, was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, and it, too, started life as a Stanford course. So I'm actually the only person you'll see tonight on this stage who has not taught a course at Stanford. Here he studied uh, philosophy and law. As an undergraduate, he founded the still-running Stanford Review. Gentlemen, we're here to talk about technology and politics. And I want to ask a Kind of simple opening question uh, to you both. Let me start with you, Reid. What do you think the lessons are of 2016 for Silicon Valley? So um, Silicon Valley generally looks at politics and the political sphere as a kind of a rugby scrum that moves very slowly, uh, doesn't actually engage in a coherent view of the future, um, and usually figures out how do we build technologies and technology companies that have uh, huge leverage effects. And so I think broadly speaking, Silicon Valley's uh, you know, general um, you know, kind of engagement with politics is to say, well, you know, just kind of uh, keep a friendly relationship while we go out and build the future. And I think that the uh, shock and the, the fact that we were definitely as a area out of touch with the um, with what was going on is it was shock is like, well, actually, in fact, if you get to um, a movement that wants to enshrine the past against the future that has actually, in fact, a set of areas where um, there's a lot of pain being felt, uh, whether it's economic futures, opioid epidemics, and other kinds of things that says, look, that we're, not, we're not convinced that this future is uh, going to be good for us, for our children. Um, and so one of the things I think broadly uh, what Silicon Valley learned was, oh shit, we need to focus on the now in addition to the future. I think part of that is also a shift from challenger to incumbent, which is uh, you know, part of how um, the, the competition amongst companies and technologies and startups, because there's you know, thousands of startups, is so fierce that there's this, this focus on just like, okay, I'm, I'm young, I'm small, I'm building. And that includes all the way to what are current giants, whether it's Facebook, Google, et cetera. They still feel like, you know, if you look at Bezos' uh, letters, uh, you know, kind of uh, you know, day one, uh, you know, kind of things. Uh, that uh, shift from, whoa, whoa, we're building something new and we're on that path to actually, in fact, we are part of the medium. We are actually, in fact, uh, part of what's fundamental to how information flows in society. And that changes a sense of responsibilities. And so, you know, one of the things I've been saying over the last 
year has been that we need to kind of get to Spider-Man ethics, which is with power comes responsibility. We're now in a position where we have the incumbency and power and we need to step up to that responsibility and we need to figure out what that right dialogue is for what is a society that we all want so that in terms of inventing the future, there's a conversation about it. And I think that's broadly you know, what I think the Valley has learned. There's you know, different differential levels along that curve. There's differential levels of response. Um, but I think it's that sense of, oh, we were out of touch and um, with the now, and we need to do that as well while continuing to try to build the future. So we'll get in the course of this conversation to what that great responsibility might look like now that you guys have realized you have great power. But let me, let me turn to, to Peter. You were, played a prominent role, more prominent than Reed in 2016. Looking back on it, what, what do you think the significance of the political events of that year have been for Silicon Valley? Do you buy Reed's story that there's been a kind of uh, shock, awakening that there are forces out there that don't want the future Silicon Valley's building? Well, I uh, agree part in part, but uh, I, su I suppose my impression is uh, that if you define lessons learned as uh, places where people have actually changed their minds, there were very few lessons learned because I think people in Silicon Valley didn't change their minds on very many substantive things at all. Uh, the, the, the sort of, the way I'd slightly reframe the question Reed posed is, uh, is how, do, how should we think about the nature of technological and scientific progress and how it is happening? And there are a lot of different ways to describe this, but I, I would suggest you can have sort of a basic tripartite division that part of it is accelerating, which is the sort of um, official Silicon Valley view. That's the Google propaganda. Technology is accelerating. It's going faster. Science is great. It's making, it's progressing at a you know incredible pace. Um, there's an inequality version which, you know, where, you know, uh, it's, it's leading to sort of a more unequal world. And, but then there's also a, a stagnation version, which is that uh, the future isn't happening at all. And, uh, and I think there's some truth to all three, to, you know, um, acceleration, inequality, and stagnation. But I think the, uh, the stagnation issue question is one that uh, we don't think enough about in Silicon Valley, where we tend to have this debate that's a narrow debate between inequality and acceleration. And, uh, and the way, you know, the way I would describe what's been happening is that uh, we've had sort of a narrow cone of, um, of progress around computers, IT, the internet, the world of bits. Um, the world of atoms has seen much less progress. And so when, you know, when we were undergraduates at Stanford in the, in the late 80s, um, you know, the, the one good field to study would have been computer science. Uh, just about all the engineering fields that people studied at the time were bad fields. You didn't want to major in electrical engineering. You know, aerospace was catastrophic. I think already by then people had figured out not to do nuclear engineering. You go down, down the list um, and that we were in a world where there was not that much progress in the world of atoms, only in the world of bits. And that this sort of stagnation, which, which runs very much counter to this you know, official uh, propaganda of acceleration that dominates Silicon Valley, it's reflected in stagnant wages. It's reflected in, in the ways in which um, the millennial generation has lower expectations than their baby boomer parents. And, um, and I think this is a, you know, this is a very big, uh, big part of the, the story we need to talk about. And, uh, and you know, even, even if you think about more local politics like the state of California, it's close to bankrupt as a state. And, uh, and so it's amazing that we have this incredible tech uh, thing going on in Silicon Valley and if you go East, just to the East Bay, across the Bay Bridge or the Dumbarton Bridge, um, you're in this, you know, in this basically failing, uh, this failing state that, you know, in the next recession probably will go broke. Um, and so that there's sort of a, a question how to how to scale this. Uh, I do think that, you know, um, the, the rough political mapping I would give on this tripartite division is, you know, the, the centrist establishment in this country is accelerationist, and that would be Clinton, that would be, you know, the Bush family. That, you know, Obama was broadly in that camp. There's sort of a non-establishment left that would be inequality, which was the Sanders line. And then, um, and then you know, the non-establishment uh, right, which Trump represented, uh, was the things, that, that stagnation. So make America great again is, is very offensive to Silicon Valley because you're telling people in Silicon Valley that you're not, that the future's not progressing. And then, um, and then the substantive question that I think it would be uh, good for us to find a way to discuss more is 
is the how how fast is the future progressing? You know, is it progressing in a in a positive direction? How much of this is really happening? And it doesn't show up in the macroeconomic data. It doesn't show up in the productivity numbers. Uh, and that's I think uh, that's I think sort of one of the one of the kinds of things that uh, that uh, you know we need to engage more. Uh, you know, I, but, I, I, by the way, uh, I want to echo with the what you know, all the speakers at the beginning said about the importance of having these debates and, and conversations. I think that, uh, I think there's always, you know, um, a tendency for us to reduce the other side to a caricature of itself. And there's, of course, a way this can get done a lot in uh, US politics at this time, where you sort of straw man the arguments. You, you pick out the weakest point, you make fun of that. And what I, what I think we should always try to do is, um, is find ways to, uh, to steel man the arguments, uh, which is the opposite of straw man. We should take the arguments of our opponents and try to make them, give them the strongest construction possible so that we understand them as well as we possibly can. Um, and, uh, and I think you know, the, the left will be able to win again at some point, but it has to start by, by steel manning what something like make America great again means, what it means in terms of this question about stagnation. And uh, it has to have arguments that are more than just telling Trump's voters to you know, hurry up and die. There's a. What did you say about character, <laughs> characterizing things? I, oh. I, I missed that part. I think it's an actor. I think, <laughs> here we go. I think it's a here perfect actor. <laughs> but in a sense, you're both saying that Silicon Valley had got detached from that part of the country that, that voted for Trump. Uh, and in, in your characterization, Peter, that's, that's where the stagnation was happening, where the acceleration was simply not perceptible. Uh, and I think, in, in the same way, Arig, your. your your identification of, of a part of the country that wasn't interested in Silicon Valley's future is the same, the same way of making a similar point. It's only a few years ago uh, that people in Silicon Valley seemed very confident about what they were doing for politics. Um, I'm gonna quote from uh, a book that Eric Schmidt wrote with Jared Cohen uh, just a few years ago, The New Digital Age. Current network technology, they wrote, truly favors the citizens. Uh, in an article in 2010, they predicted quite accurately with respect to North Africa and the Middle East that authoritarian governments would be caught off guard when large numbers of their citizens, armed with virtually nothing but cell phones, took to the streets. So glad, confident morning back then said, the internet is good for democracy. Somehow that story seems less plausible in 2018. So... How do we think about the politics of a networked world when some authoritarian regimes seem to know exactly how to use these tools? Reid? So I think that the, the optimism comes from people who say, well, if you don't count bad actors, you don't count the attempt to interfere with other folks, and you say, we have this empowerment of individuals that goes across the fact that you have a mini computer, you have access to information, you can learn things, you can communicate with a wide variety of people. Those are all the things that uh, Eric and Jared were talking about. Uh, they're still definitely true, but you have to, part of moving from challenger to incumbent is when you begin to have a, the medium of communication, the medium of transaction, the medium of interaction, the medium of political decision, then that becomes something where in the contest of, of, of um, human tribes, that then becomes manipulable, corruptible, uh, you know, gameable in various ways. And by the way, entrepreneurs do it too. Like they figure out how to game, you know, um, uh, you know kind of virality and other kinds of things. This is, this is not actually, in fact, completely new. What's new is that the scale is now at kind of the real politique and the politique of nations. And you know, a, a microcosm of that could be the Peter Gabriel witness thing, which used to distribute video cameras to say film human rights atrocities because bringing those films then sheds you know, sunlight to them. And now of course what you have is you have authoritarian regimes looking at social media as to say who was at the protest to try to track down them and their family, which is a you know, kind of an alternative way and a, a way of doing that. Um, I think that the general uh, problem with many people's reactions when they say, well, there is a fault of technology. Like we can't really discern truth amongst the fake news. We can have the Russians not doing cyber hacking, but by doing essentially uh, social meme hacking. 
and that that is a problem and that we should roll back. And actually the usual answer is roll forward. The usual answer is we should figure out what to do about that and we should evolve the system in the right way. And so I remain um, you know, kind of optimistic but not utopian in the, in the technolo technological possibilities. But what it means is you have to, like when you think about it, it's just as like for example when we got uh, PayPal to a certain size, you have to start thinking that there's criminals using it and other things, and then you have to start building against that as part of what you're doing. And I think that's part of what's happening with information flows, trust, uh, it's, it's, it's influence within kind of a democratic political system. Let me just follow up on, on that point, because you mentioned the fake news issue, which is very much in people's minds, also the Russian role. Y your forthcoming book, A Blitz scaling on my reading says these are fixable problems yes. but we have to go forward we can't hire an army of fact checkers yes uh, or uh, superannuated newspaper editors talk a little bit about how you do that fixing how you imagine that that working well so part of i mean the uh part of what you can do so people imagine that you can do an ai to do truth checking that's i think a, a way is off i think that's fictional uh, however, what you can do is you can do, for example, because uh, we already do this with credit systems, PayPal, et cetera, you can do identity checking. Um, you can uh, do things that have a way of saying, okay, is this information, like you can have, for example, a, an information registry to say these are sources of information that have signed up for, uh, call it journalistic uh, accountability, like I can be questioned or or attacked on not fact checking because I don't think there is such a thing as alternative facts um, and uh, those uh, those kinds of things can actually be baked into the platform it's not so much as X is true as much as like what is the uh, uh, a better source of identity and provenance of the information and uh, what where do you go to cross check or to say is someone standing up for this and saying this is really true and I followed a journalistic uh, process for it. And I think you can see more of that kind of thing. And by the way, you already see some of this in like, for example, what happens in search quality results. Like part of the whole uh, emphasis on search quality is to say, this is actually accurate information against this query. And you're essentially trying to bring that kind of thing to uh, looking at information across these platforms. Peter, let me put this question in a slightly different way to you. Has has the internet, have the network platforms altered the nature of politics itself? In other words, are we still going to be having left-right debates like you were having as undergraduates, I was having as an undergraduate in the 1980s, or is there going to be a different kind of politics? Is it going to be authoritarian versus democratic? Is it going to be establishment versus populist, growth believers versus stagnationists. How, how do you think about the, the new terminology even of politics? Well, it's always hard to say because the, I think these technologies don't naturally um, always map in a very precise way. And so making predictions was a treacherous business for Eric Schmidt and it's probably also somewhat treacherous business for us today in, in, in 2018. Um, you know, one, one axis that I am struck by is sort of the centralization versus decentralization axis. And so I think, uh, Reid, you just represented the centralization thing, where it's all, everything happens in one place, and then it has to sort of get curated in just the right way, um, so that, you know, you, you have a, uh, uh, you know, you have, you have a good debate, but within the proper um, limits, within the right proper limits. And, uh, and that's, that's the sort of question that happens in a massively centralized context. In a more decentralized context, uh, that, uh, that would perhaps uh, not, not happen in quite the same way. So uh, for example, you know, one of the, two of the areas of tech that, uh, that people um, are very excited about in Silicon Valley today are crypto on the one hand and AI on the other. And, um, and even though I think these things are underdetermined, I, I do think these two map you know, in a way uh, politically very tightly on this uh, centralization, decentralization thing. Uh, crypto's decentralizing, AI is centralizing, or if you want to frame it you know, more ideologically, you could say that crypto is libertarian and AI is communist. Um, and, um, and of course, we always hear only the first half because we're biased to the left. But, um, but uh, you know, AI is communist in the sense that it's about big data, it's about big um, governments controlling all the data, knowing more about you than you know about yourself. So a bureaucrat in Moscow could, in fact, set the prices of potatoes 
in Leningrad and hold you know, the whole system together. Um, and you know, if you look at the you know, Chinese Communist Party, it loves AI and hates crypto. So it actually, you know, actually fits pretty closely on that level. And I think that's, that's, sort of a, that's a purely technological version of this debate. And, uh, and I do think, so you know, I think, I think you know, there probably are ways that AI could be libertarian and there are ways that crypto could be communist, but I, I think that's harder to do. If all the cryptocurrencies are mined in China and Russia, that might. I think they're trying to stop even that at this point. Can I follow up on, on, on the implications of that? Because I guess in Reed's world uh, of not necessarily AI, but some, some authority authenticating or validating what is good news as Multiple opposed authorities. to fake news. Uh, but there are authorities yes. uh, that will give the, good seal of, the seal of good uh, housekeeping approval for some sources. Um, whereas in your more libertarian model, presumably through some blockchain decentralized architecture, we'll be able to differentiate the fake from the, the true. Well, it's always right? a it's, it, well, in a, in a centralized world, the question emerges. In a decentralized one, it doesn't emerge as well. So, so of, yeah, of course, the, uh, the larger platform companies have, you know, have a challenge along the lines that Reed describes. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, I, I would describe it as a two-front war that they have to fight. They have to fight, on the one hand, you know, against hate speech, fake news, you know, that whole ensemble of things. And then they have to also fight against the people who want to limit speech, uh, in a, um, overly narrow speech, in the name of fighting fake news. And because it's a two-front war, it's much more complicated than, uh, than just uh, fighting on one front. Can we talk a little bit? But in the brief? decentralized world, it's much harder to set up kind of like, you know, it's an interesting thing to say it's libertarian versus communist. You could say it's libertarian versus rule of law. Right, it's much harder to set up a kind of a well-regulated. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so it's it's actually much harder in the decentralized system to set up uh, rules and norms. Like, for example, one of the things that's massive problem in the crypto community right now is it makes GamerGate look, you know, relatively tame in its in the way that it treats women in terms of public discourse and so forth. So there's a whole bunch of problems that need to be fixed over there that are much harder to fix in that arena. Now that being said, we're both. We both think that the invention of cryptocurrency um, is a uh, important uh, kind of innovation alongside the internet for allowing a bunch of, of apps to be developed within kind of the internet of money, the internet of value as a way of doing it. So it's neither of us are, are negative on cryptocurrency, or at least not negative the same way. But, but that's one of the virtues of the kind of the rule of law systems. Well, but, but this is always like, you could say, I would say AI is a much more transparent world. And then the, quest, uh, the centralized world is more transparent. And then the question you could always ask is, what's the opposite of transparency? Is it criminality or is it uh, privacy? And you know, from a, the point of view of a centralized uh, state, uh, the opposite, you know, yeah, it's, it's always, you know, why, why do you want to have secrets? Why do we not know who you are and what you're doing? Um, why do you need privacy? If you're, doing every, if you're behaving yourself perfectly, you have nothing to hide. Um, and so, um, but, uh, and you're a criminal. Not only a criminal doesn't want to have transparency, but I think it can, it can really cut both ways. I wanna come back to this issue of the relationship between China in particular and big data uh, companies, because I think it's a hugely important one. Before we get there, let's talk a bit about inequality, which popped up at the beginning of our discussion, but is, is I think, pretty central to what Silicon Valley is doing uh, perhaps unintentionally, and you know, even if one just looks at the case of crypto, it looks like another case of the smart people who thought of it first become spectacularly wealthy, and then the suckers like me who arrive late to the game, having ignored their teenage sons, right the way through the bubble, and buy at the top, get <laughs> crushed. Uh, uh, That's called it, the stock market. You yeah, may have well, seen we, that. this, this yes. has existed before, but <laughs> yes. what's striking to me about about Silicon Valley's economics is the winner takes all, and you put, make this point in Blitzscaling, as indeed, uh, Peter, you do in your book, Zero to One, um, that's great for the winner, and you can see the winners in this neck of the woods in their Teslas, but is there not a sense in which, from the loser's vantage point, this is deeply alienating, and it just seems as if each new innovation is a fast track to wealth for a bunch of smart, young, well-educated, uh, insiders and everybody else is just a user handing over their data for free. 
Well, what I would say is a couple of things. So one is, well, A, it's not handing over their data for free. So frequently that comment is like, well, what has Google done for me? Well, provided search, for example, right? You know, free information, uh, uh, free access to a whole bunch of videos, a bunch of other things. So, you know, maps. I mean, there's a ton of stuff. It's like, what have they done for me? It's like, well, that's what the data exchange oh, looks Monty like. That Monty Python sketch, what did the <laughs> yes. Romans ever, ever do done for us? us yeah. other what than did Google aqueduct, ever do for yes, us? Other than roads, aqueduct, <laughs> public education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <laughs> and so... I'm glad we've got the Google Roman Empire analogy going. <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> exactly. They'll, they'll, they'll love us for that. Um, so I think that the... Um, but the inequality problem, that, yeah. that the unintended consequence of all this innovation seems to be to amplify an, an inequality that was already quite advanced in the 1990s, and it's only got worse. And a large part of what's driving it is these extraordinary, ret incredible returns to, to the blitz scalers, the winners. Well, so I think that there's always, in most times in human history, you're the historian, there has been a fairly large uh, uh, divergence in wealth whether it's financial systems, whether it's you know, aristocracy and landowners and so forth. And there's no, you know, that, that is actually, I think, broadly a feature of human society, not a, bug. Not, not a bug and not necessarily new. I think what's a feature of the current thing is, like for example, you're mentioning cryptocurrency is something that Silicon Valley is getting wealthy off of. Actually, in fact, I think cryptocurrency, most of the people who are getting wealthy off are outside of Silicon Valley. Cryptocurrency was, most adopted, and, and there's a couple of good companies here, but like the general range of mining uh, cryptocurrency, of early trading in it, like it took a couple of years for Silicon Valley to realize cryptocurrency was happening. It was one of those things that was more, like the person I refer to as, as patient zero for Bitcoin in Silicon Valley is an Argentinian entrepreneur named Wences Cazares, uh, who is right now down in Patagonia, um, but you know he generally lives in Woodside, not you know, too far from here. And, um, and so I actually think that the, the notion that, that the incentive is for the creation of the new thing, the thing that actually, in fact, could have a global impact and that the benefit of that global impact going to some individuals is not necessarily a bad thing. I think that the important thing is to make sure that the bulk of people are having a sense of meaning and progress in their lives and inclusion. And one of the things that an over-focus on incomes, this is a little bit of, like, for example, what where Peter is making a stagnation point, is, um, is not paying sufficient attention to, well, what happens when we get like free encyclopedias for everyone and, and free learning materials for everyone and, and, and free entertainment for everyone and a bunch of other things that all come about with kind of quality of life. And the, the only measure of human progress is not what is a relatively arcane GDP measure, but also various kinds of uh, quality of life measures. And I think that those things are coming about for it. And what you would, I think, feel justly saying is if, well, this person created cryptocurrency or these set of people created cryptocurrency and made a bunch of money and everyone else is losing, if there aren't other paths forward to winning, then that would be a problem. I actually think one of the good things is, is if, if I were to make a prediction, I think I'd say that five to 10 years from now, there will be at least 50% as many additional big tech companies and so forth. It won't be shrinking, it will be growing in terms of the number of different options and where they fit in the world and life. And uh, what I would want to see from those is more ability, because like for example, a, a centralized platform is a good thing if it's creating generativity, if it allows a lot of people, like for example, you take Airbnb or you take eBay and you say, actually in fact, I can add to my income. I can be a micro entrepreneur on this platform. I can make more things happen. I think we want to see more of those to enable more of more people to say, well, I don't have to be a coder. I don't have to be a tech entrepreneur and I can still make progress in my life. And I think that's the thing that we need to be more focused on as we figure out, okay, how to be inclusive. Do you, do you think conventional economics actually underestimating the benefits of the internet? Do you, do you buy on that? Well, let me just respond to the inequality yeah. thing first. So I, 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 don't, I don't think, um, uh, I think we should maybe start by talking a little bit about uh, where the inequality is actually experienced. And you know, Silicon Valley is in some ways a very unequal place. And when people leave Silicon Valley, it's not because there are no economic opportunities. It's because the real estate costs too much. And you know, there's some studies I've seen where almost the entire increase in inequality in the last uh, 20 or 30 years is simply um, increase in inequality of land ownership. You know, if you were a Stanford graduate 50 years ago, you worked, got a job at Hewlett Packard, you could have gotten 
know, a three-bedroom starter home as a 22-year-old in Palo Alto. Um, and so, you know, in a way, um, this is this is sort of this is how the stagnation manifests itself in you know in land prices. As a venture capitalist, I often think that almost all the venture capital money I'm investing is going to you know urban slumlords in the form of you know incredibly onerous commercial leases and of course the fairly high salaries you have to pay people in Silicon Valley, which, which they have to then pay uh, to rent to um, to all their their landlords. Um, and this is you know this is maybe. <coughs> Maybe this is loosely linked to tech because we're a networked economy and it's, it's very hard to do things outside of Silicon Valley and you have networked cities like New York City or, or London for, for finance. But, uh, but I think that's sort of where the problem is. And then the, you know, and then the, the, the remedy in my mind would be, would be that you, you know, seriously um, think about uh, changing zoning laws or things like that. There's, a, there's an economist I always like to refer to in the late 19th century, Henry George, who had this... Uh, there was this theorem that I think Stiglitz actually proved um, about 100 years later, the Henry George theorem, which says that uh, in, a, um, in a certain kind of urban area where not enough new things can be built, all the value gets captured by landlords. And so, uh, you know, Reed's saying, you know, you're saying the value gets captured by a few tech entrepreneurs. Reed's saying it's this consumer surplus that gets captured by everybody. Uh, and I think the question we have to ask is perhaps, uh, perhaps a great deal of it was actually just captured by by landlords, they're not the people who get you know put on the front pages of magazines, um, but uh, but that's sort of that's the, that's the way in which inequality is extremely profound. And I think I think if you solve the zoning problem, I don't think people would have problems with some people making more money than others in crypto or at Google or anything like that. Um, you know, it's, it's it's just it's just the land use problem. I suppose I'm struggling a bit to believe that there are somewhere hidden in these neighborhoods landlords making more money from rents than you guys are Collective, making from collectively, your investments. But collectively, it's, 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 it's much more distributed. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, 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 it's been a phenomenal bull market in, 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 in the land price. You know, my, my parents uh, you know, got a home in Foster City, when, uh, just north of here, for $120,000 in 1978. Today it's worth two and a half million. And, uh, and you know, if, you, if you were in the older generation in the US and you got a house in, an, in a major urban center, you're able to retire. If you didn't, uh, you weren't able to save for your retirement. So, it, 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 And then if you're a young person, it's almost impossible to even get started. It was a pupil of, of Henry George who came up, if memory serves, with the game Monopoly. Uh, and uh, I can't resist asking you both about Monopoly, since there's a sense in which your books, in their different ways, are celebrations of Monopoly. And, Conventional economics said that the monopoly wasn't a good thing and certainly would tend to lead to rent-seeking by the owners of the monopolies. Um, can you defend these winner-take-all type companies which blitz scaling produces? Is this just inherent in the nature of the business that there will be, if not monopolies, then things that are very like them? Yeah, I mean, frequently we refer to them as winner-takes-most businesses versus all, but... Um uh, you know, this is, and when people talk about network effects, that's that's the kind of thing that they're talking about. This is a polite way of putting it. Yeah. Yes, it's a polite way of putting it. It's, uh, you know, Peter uh, thinks it's a classically deceptive way of putting it, um, uh, which is the reason he, in Zero to One he tried to call it out as, you know, no, this is actually just a monopoly. Um, I think the key question is what happens if there is a centralization of a platform. There's a lot, a lot of virtues and centralizations of platforms. Um, they can uh, create enormous generativity. They can create like a lot of, like for example, you have a platform iOS, Android, you can create a lot of apps on top of it. You have an open platform like the internet, you have a huge amount of, of productivity. Those kinds of things I think are very valuable to have those platforms and platforms are more valuable the broader base they are in terms of your ability to build businesses on them, reach customers, have communications, do transactions, et cetera. It's part of the reason why there's only a few you know, relatively few like credit cards and so forth because once they're processing, like the, the thing is, well, should I accept this random new card or should I accept Visa or MasterCard? Well, I'll take Visa or MasterCard just easier and it makes the whole system run more efficiently. The key thing you have to look at is does it accelerate the right kind of, of opportunities and futures and innovation and build towards the future or does it lock away the future? So the classic concern that people have around monopolies is that they try to um, enshrine the past versus the future. And so they go, okay, I just can collect rents. I'm not going to invent anything because I can I can sit on my monopoly in order to collect the rents. That 
that's obviously a problem. That's obviously bad. That's the kind of thing you need to act against. Now, uh, Peter and I have actually been on stage before talking about monopoly with zero to one in his book. And, you know, part of actually, in fact, if they're actually in contention, even if they're very profitable and they're actually reinvesting their profits in order to compete with each other and try to bring products and services to the world, frequently in the, in the modern cases, free products and services, you know, that's not clear that that isn't actually, in fact, a, a substantial social benefit in terms of how that's playing out. And that's the reason why, like, part of what I look at and I say, well, what ways should we be trying as technologists and inventors of the future is say, well, uh, make paths by which people can not just find information or communicate or find entertainment or find education, but also make things by which people can create work for themselves, create economic opportunity. That's part of the reason I, you know, uh, Airbnb and eBay as, as kind of simple examples of these kinds of things. And he said, well, there's a marketplace. Marketplaces have natural network effects. They tend to be dominant, and that's where trading happens. Well, that's okay if you're actually enabling a lot of business and creation on top of it. It may even be good. Um, uh, before we uh, get to you, Peter, I want to just uh, point out to the audience that we'll be taking questions from you. Uh, but this being close to Silicon Valley, we won't be doing it in some kind of old school way with microphones or bits of paper, God forbid. Uh, no, we'll be using uh, Slido, uh, and you'll be, with the aid of your electronic devices, and too bad if you didn't bring one, uh, able uh, to uh, put on your questions uh, via Slido. Uh, they will then be uh, moderated by uh, our undergraduate uh, committee, and I'll, I'll get the winners. And that's how we're going to do Q&A tonight. I'm telling you this now so that you have time to follow the instructions, which I hope have now appeared uh, above us, and, uh, and, and figure out how to get online to Slido and pose a question. Uh, I hope this works. Because if it doesn't, um, then we will have to use scraps of paper, and it will be a, a great embarrassment, uh, certainly for me. Peter, while, while everybody's figuring out Slido and preparing uh, devastating questions, the conventional response to any mention of monopoly was always antitrust. And uh, I guess as somebody who was at the law school here, you're the right person to ask, is this, is this coming eventually? Let's assume, fast forward, there's some swing to the left in American politics. Maybe the next populist is, is Bernie Sanders. Does antitrust finally show up in Silicon Valley and say, uh, you naughty monopolies have to be broken up? Will it be like Standard Oil? Well, antitrust is always uh, an extremely um, you know, big, crazy weapon. And it's sort of very unclear you know, when, when, that gets, when that gets used in, in different contexts. Uh, you know, the, by the way, I'm not um, simply pro-monopoly. I want to be very clear on that. Uh, the distinction I always make is between dynamic monopolies where people invent things. And that's where we, we also protect those in our society. We protect those with patent copyright laws. And so if you have a dynamic monopoly, that's good. A static monopoly, that's more like a rentier, like a landlord, or a, uh, you know, maybe a, a troll collecting a tax at the bridge, or something um, like that. Those are, those are more problematic. And the, the question is, what kinds of monopolies do we want to actually encourage uh, as, that are sort of analogous to IP? and which ones are more static and problematic uh, and that are the subject of antitrust. And that's sort of the, that's why it's a complicated question because there are, in fact, good monopolies and bad monopolies the way, the way, um, we, the way we think about it. Antitrust laws, I understand, that, that allows that. I say that the more, you know, the more general question is just, um, you know, how much of a, you know, how much um, regulation is coming towards, towards the, uh, the tech companies in Silicon Valley. Uh, this is, again, sort of somewhat hard, hard to predict. My, um, the thing that I'm, I'm struck by is how, uh, and that I worry about, is how, how poorly the big tech companies are playing the uh, sort of political game that they're, they're, supposed, to, they're supposed to play. And you know, we had, you know, in 2008, we had, a, you know, we had an enormous uh, financial crisis that um, you know, where, and I think the banks are still worse actors than the, the tech companies. Um, and the banks got relatively light regulation after 2008 because, um, they, they were sort of bipartisan. They backed both parties. Um, and the, uh, the sort of uh, thing that maybe is idealistic or maybe stupid or maybe just wrong is that Silicon Valley 
is a one-party state. Um, it's, it's all in on one party. And that's when you get in trouble politically in our society, when you're all on one side. Um, the other side doesn't care for you, and your side doesn't care for you either at the end of the day because they don't need to. And, um, and so the thing, you know, you, you said that the regulation will come from the left. It may well come from the Republicans at this point. It may start with the Republicans. And that, you're really in trouble when the re Republicans want to regulate you. And how might they and, do that? Because I can't imagine Republicans doing a big antitrust action. Well, it's, you know, there are sort of a lot of, I'm not going to try to give them ideas, but, uh, <laughs> but there are. <laughs> um, oh, but, go on. But, but it, could, it, it could, you know, it can, it, it can, you're really in trouble when you get conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats to agree. And uh, the, the, the worry I have is that the response, the one party culture of Silicon Valley is, you know, we'll never get you versus we don't really, we have you anyway, so we don't need it. And, and both parties end up, um, end up coming after you. I'd Reed? like to expand on this a little bit because actually one of the mistakes I think is made a lot in thinking about this is we are moving from a US hyperpolar world to a multipolar world. And, and so everything that is dis discussed here is presumes that the US is the world and everything else is a, is a shadow. And so I actually think we are already in a place where really what you're seeing with monopoly, antitrust and so forth is actually a return to competition from nation states. So it's part of the reason why you know, the Europeans kind of blend some legitimate social concerns together with the, we're not happy with the fact that we don't have as strong a tech industry as we'd like, so we'd like to impose some regulation. Um, and they really focus on Silicon Valley, not realizing that China's coming along, you know, kind of full steam. And I don't think China is going to dismantle its monopolies because I think it understands that actually, in fact, creation of industries of the future is really important. And so I think that the interesting question that is people say, well, we should slow down, we should enshrine the past. You know, I'm quite certain, here I'll, I'll engage, since Peter already took a shot at the left, um, you know, I'm quite certain that we'll want coal mining jobs back in, in, in great profusion and quantity because it's the right work in, in history of the future for us. Um, and so, um, you know, basically I think that the, the question is you have to say, look, what is the industries of the future? We want to be there and part of it. And, and the, the, because it's political fighting and infighting, that's precisely where you begin to see, you know, the decay of Rome. It's like nothing else matters, it's only fighting within, so it's like, okay, we're, we're Republicans, we think the tech industry is, is progressive and not for us, so we're gonna go regulate them, and that's gonna be you know, not an America first policy, that's gonna be an America last policy. So I, I'm starting to get questions through uh, Slido, I'm relieved to say that it's working, and I can't help going to one of them uh, now because it sort of uh, it fits in with the conversation we've had. So far, Randy asks, you've agreed more than disagreed. What is something you strongly disagree about? And I'm guessing from what's being said at the moment that this administration might be the answer to that question. Well, I did actually, in fact, create a card game. I was hoping you'd bring uh, that up. A card called Trumped Up Cards, um, which is a, a model on... Um, uh, cards Against Humanity, uh, and um, just for entertainment value, one of the cards in that deck, I give Peter one of the very first decks, is Peter Thiel, uh, is as, as actually, in fact, one of the cards in the deck. So there, that would be one more of the more humorous areas. Peter, um, so America first uh, could end up being America last if Republicans just go after Silicon Valley out of sheer political spite. Uh, is that a plausible scenario in your view? Well, there are, uh, there are um, a lot of um, ways the Trump administration could get things wrong. And the, you know, the, uh, you know, there's a lot that's, of course, very broken in Washington, D.C. generally. And so I think it's a mistake just to, to blame um, any, any sort of one, one person on it. I, I would say that, uh, that uh, I do, do always think that uh, there are some very real problems that Trump has pointed to that uh, we should take more seriously. You know, the, the one that, uh, that you know, sort of from an elite point of view is, is the craziest, is that uh, you should be um, more restrictionist on trade. That always seems like a you know, really crazy view that uh, Trump has. And, and it's not clear that being restrictionist is a good idea. On the other hand, there's obviously something, you know, um, deeply screwed up in the trade relations. You know, in, 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 a, in, a, in a globalizing 
healthily globalizing world, the fl uh, capital should flow from the developed to the, the developing world because you have higher growth rates in the developing countries than the developed world. That's sort of the convergence theory of globalization. This was the UK in 1900, had a current account surplus, 4% of GDP, and the money flowed out. If you look at our planet from outer space, the money is flowing the wrong way. It is flowing from a fast-growing China to a slow-growing US, or you could say poor peasants in China are saving money to invest in the US, and it's because, and it's because that's, that's just the other side of these incredible uh, trade deficits. And, uh, and so, you know, if, if you believe in globalization, we should have trade surpluses. And, uh, and that tells you there's something wrong with the trade arrangements. Now, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, that you want to be protectionist or that you want to create national champion companies or anything like that. But it is at least a question that, uh, that one should, should raise very hard about, uh, um, about, you know, is there something wrong with the US-China relationship when the only thing they seem to want from us are McDonald's hamburgers? Well, that and uh, you can blame that on us because we're not building anything and you can blame it on China, but it's at least a question we should be asking. Let, let me follow up on China, because Ravi's asked, what does the rise of China mean for the future of Silicon Valley and technology more generally? You alluded to it earlier, Peter. Talk, talk a bit more about this. To me, this is the fascinating thing. Europeans blew this. They're nowhere. They don't really have any, any major technology companies. But the Chinese, perhaps as much by accident as by, by design, kept the US technology companies at bay and allowed their own so-called bat companies, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, to, to flourish. And now these are the real rivals for the Silicon Valley companies. And yet their relationship with government's completely different from the relationship that we've been talking about in the United States. It's far from the hostile relationship that we see between Silicon Valley and Washington today. They're hand in glove. So talk a little bit about what you think China's success in technology means uh, for Silicon Valley. Is, is the future perhaps there rather than here? Well, it's it's badly underestimated in Silicon Valley, uh, and uh, I do think uh, I do think Alibaba and Tencent, in particular, in particular, uh, at some point are going to be trying to um, expand outside of China. I expect that they will try to do so in a fairly aggressive way, and um, it's uh, and I think uh, people in Silicon Valley are are probably fairly myopic about that. Maybe maybe in the U.S. in the U.S. generally, uh, and certainly certainly the question of you know, what year does China overtake the US? This was a very big question people asked, say, in 2005, 2006, 2007. You know, it's, it's, we're 13 years closer to that than we were in 2005. And we seem to be asking the question much less today than we were 13 years ago, even though we're presumably 13 years closer to when that happens. And uh, it's almost as though um, we've, we've uh, stopped thinking it about it as the data has gotten closer. My calculation would be if you if you look at it on a you know PPP basis, China's already overtaken us. GDP, it's like 2030. If you do an average of uh, purchasing power parity and GDP, which I think is a better measure than either of the two alone, you get to about 2020. It's going to happen in three years, three four years, and uh, and that's barely uh, that's barely registering as a as a conversation uh, as I a conversation here. Pete, so. Since there was a request for Peter and I to disagree, uh, the specific thing that I would disagree with Peter on is I actually don't think Silicon Valley is blind to China. I think Silicon Valley is quite aware that in the entire world, the shape of the technological future, the, the most significant contender is China. Um, they worry about the protected Chinese market. There's a whole variety of Silicon Valley companies that uh, can't play within China. Uh, they worry about uh, more support from the government, anything from uh, data to uh, kind of generally uh, labor laws. They worry about the fact that there is a, a city in China that's graduating a million engineers every year, you know, let alone the whole thing. And so that's part of the reason why Silicon Valley tends to be such a large advocate of, you know, especially high-end immigration, although all to some degree of fairness. But that's the, you know, how do we, how do we play against that? And you know, part of when I um, you know, meet with various European government officials, I say, look, you're really focused on Silicon Valley, but what we're worried about is, is what the future looks like vis-a-vis -vis China, and there's all these issues. And I think if you, you went around and talked to every single you know, medium to large company within Silicon Valley, they're all thinking about what is the China market look like, what does competition with China look like, uh, Tencent, Alibaba, Baidu, are 
highly innovative companies. There's a lot of interesting things that they're doing. Um, there's things that we now have, you know, kind of ideas and copies of startups here that are of ideas that are made in China, right? I mean, there's a there's a ton of these things going on, and, and so the specific disagreement is actually, in fact, Silicon Valley treats this as a, a very serious threat indeed, um, and you know, it's kind of you know, it's either uh, healthy competition, which I think Peter thinks is an oxymoron, uh, or a, a contest for the future. So you're the perfect people to ask a follow-up question on this. I was just uh, a couple of weeks ago in Hangzhou, which is the headquarters of Alibaba. Uh, but you don't just need to go there. You can go anywhere, and you'll see that uh, in financial technology, China is a long way ahead. Why is it that we don't pay for everything with PayPal, but the Chinese pay for everything with Alipay or WeChat Pay? I mean, to the extent that you do not see a credit card, and when Chinese people come to the United States, they chortle at our antiquated behavior. You guys were way ahead of China in thinking about an online payment system, and yet, from where I'm sitting, they've completely overtaken. Now, I would love to know why you think that is, because all I see when I go to China is ubiquitous online payment systems that have but become th th dominant. This is not just payments. I mean, there, there are all sorts of places where um, if you're a um, undeveloped country, you can go straight to the technological frontier, whereas if you're reasonably developed, maybe the delta is not that big, and so it's, 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 a, it's, it's slower to adopt things. And so you would find the same thing to be true of mobile payments in the developing world generally versus the developed world. And pace or, you in know, Kenya. Um, E-commerce is much bigger in China as a percent of commerce because people never built big retail stores. I think Japan has you know, the most elaborate you know, retail industry, and that's probably the, the country where you have the smallest percent of e-commerce. And it's not because you know, Japan's unusually backward, but because the old economy of Japan actually functioned reasonably well. And uh, you know, the payment system in the US is, is, is not seamlessly efficient, but it, is, um, it, it, it works reasonably well. It's not a trivial thing to start a new payments company. You have to always you know, find something where there's a big delta that you know, can really drive um, an intense need for adoption. And, uh, and, ha and having something that's just a little bit better for a lot of people is often a very difficult uh, technology to, to drive out. Jack Ma said something at Davos uh, last week which really struck home for me, namely that the, the Chinese model would work better in emerging markets, pretty much for the reason you've just given. Uh, and that left me wondering if essentially companies like Alibaba will be able to roll out their platforms really easily in emerging markets and the Silicon Valley companies may be left with just the developed world. Is that a scenario that you think is plausible? One of the things I've been saying for a few years is there's three internets. There's the English internet, the Chinese internet, and everything else. And where the actual combat will be is in the everything else. Right. And who, th who do you think will win in that, in that contest? Is it conceivable that, in fact, the Chinese companies, that BAT, that very, BAT could beat FANG? Very conceivable. What do you think? Uh, yes, but I, I, I still disagree with Reid that this is generally understood in Silicon Valley uh, because um, the, the big Chinese companies so dominate China that uh, you know, people in Silicon Valley don't even think they can break into China that much. When they don't think they can break in, they don't think about it that much. And so one of the, one of the um, benefits for China of the sort of um, state champions of the Chinese firewall is that um, um, there's no incentive for us to think about what's going on in China that much because it's gotten so hard to do anything. And, uh, and so I, I think uh, whenever, whenever China starts to do things aggressively outside of it, uh, we will not be paying as much attention as we should. Questions are, are pouring in. A, a number of them are about American politics, um, and I want to come to those in a minute. But there was a big question that Ben has asked. Is American democracy in crisis? And do big tech companies have any moral responsibility to preserve or defend American democracy? Reid, does it feel like a crisis of democracy to you? Uh, I think it's uh, unquestionably a crisis of democracy. I think that the notion of political polarization where uh, legitimate news organizations are called fake news and you have attack on institutions, um, where the question about um, foreign government interference within our democratic policy process is weakly responded to, I think all of those things lead to 
uh, an unquestionable uh, turmoil and, and challenge. Um, I think that the uh, I think that uh, tech companies have a uh, responsibility, as do I think uh, citizens and other companies and the uh, government to try to do stuff about this. I think that the you know like for example people say well a Facebook should they have known that the Russians were going to try to social meme hack it. And that's legitimate for a company to say, look, we didn't think that was our thing. We, we were, we're a company. We're doing business stuff. We're not trying to be you know, in the game between nation states. Um, but now that you know about it, there's a question of how do you, how do you provide services well. Fortunately, I think the people there are, uh, you know, have you know, actually care and are trying to figure out how, how, how to learn the right lessons and how to be good citizens in this, but I think it's, it's, it's unquestionable that uh, our democracy is in turmoil. But I, I would, Peter. I, you know, you can agree that things are more polarized than they were in the past. The polarization trend, I would say, did not start with the internet. You know, even though maybe there are things about internet communication technologies that are, um, you know, um, sort of create an, an unfair, un, uh, sort of a crazed intensity where you have sort of the, your daily minute of hate on Twitter you know, sort of this, uh, or you know, sort of these, these sort of virtual mobs on the internet where you just sort of attack random people, and um, and that's you know there so there are aspects of it that you know maybe com uh, contributing to, to polarization, but uh, that doesn't mean that that's the the main thing that's causing it. You know, I, I would say polarization in the U.S. has been increasing since the late '60s, um, and I would date it to roughly the time period when the growth slowed, and you know we've been in an era of relative economic stagnation since the 1970s. And that's why I think the, the primary um, cause for polarization is, um, is economic stagnation. Because in a world without growth, it's not clear, and we're not you know, strictly a democracy, we're a sort of a representative, um, rep we're a constitutional republic. We're an indirect democracy, and that's, um, you know, the dem democracy is modified by the republic, the republic is modified by the constitution. But uh, even that system doesn't work that well without growth, because the way our system of government works is you have a bunch of people sitting around the table in a state legislature or legislature, and they craft legislation where there's more for you and more for you, and if Reed's the difficult person, there's no, no more for Reed. And, um, and in a, when the pie is growing, it's relatively easy to craft win-win legislation. When the pie is not growing, um, you know everything becomes zero sum, it becomes much more hostile, there's a loser for every winner, um, and I think that's the, that's the dynamic that, uh, that you know, I would say is 80% of the problem with polarization. And you know, maybe tech, maybe the way the message forms is 20%, don't want to minimize that 20%, but we shouldn't turn it into the scapegoat for all of, our, uh, all of the problems in our society. Would you buy that the polarization would have happened anyway, even if none of this stuff had been invented? Oh, and we still I did I politics with TV and newspapers? I don't, uh, yeah. Um, you know, um, one of my favorites, uh, Fox News, um, you know, or, or various forms of talk I'm sure radio, you were watching it last which, night, yes, glued which, to the yes, state of the exactly. Union. Uh, such uh, visionaries as Sean Hannity, who, you know, um, uh, you know, whose every word I hang upon. The, um, and so, uh, look, I think the polarization, I, look, broadly speaking, where Peter and I agree is actually, in fact, growth is super important, uh, non-zero sum psychology, where you kind of say, hey, look, we can keep playing because even if you know Peter gets more of this hand and 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 Neil gets less, we play again and see where we, we end up. That's extremely important part, and I think that is a contributory uh, portion of this. And I didn't uh, mean to say that I think that technology was a unique contributor to the uh, polarization as much as I think part of you know what has happened is that there's now kind of these new media, these new ways of 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 kind of uh, sharing information. And we have to kind of get to a, how do we get to collective truth? Um, and I actually think we should be focusing on how do we get to real news versus labeling things fake news. Okay, but that's, it's, a true piece. it's always a two front war. So there is, a, there is a war against fake news and real news. I don't know how you can get to real news without labeling things as fake news, by the way, since the, the way you sound, make it sound like there are two categories. But, but, um, but the other front is, is that there are all these people who also want to fight um, you know, for, for certain types of news in the name of excluding things. And so it's always a two-front war. That, that's what makes it complicated. If it, if it was simply, 
well, you know, um, anyone who complains about a certain type of speech will listen to them and will get rid of that speech because it's not true or it's offensive or something. Um, that gets weaponized very problematically, and you don't end up in a good equilibrium. That prompts a question which, um, which has been in my mind for a while and, and was uh, brought to the surface by what happened after the Charlottesville events. And, and that is the possibility that without our even being aware of it, uh, internet companies begin to censor the public sphere and the process of exclusion that you just alluded to gets much less attention but might actually be a more insidious problem. Is, is that other front that you talk about one that we should worry more about? Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna try to defend hate speech at all. And that's not, I don't think that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. I think it's, it's where the line gets drawn that seems to me problematic. Who, who decides what is hate speech? Uh, on the internet? Well, it's, it, um, I think it's always this two-front problem. So, I, I mean, there's certainly certain categories of speech that are hate speech uh, that, you know, if you, that I think we could all, we'd all agree to. I don't think that's what, I don't think that's where you know, the really problematic aspect of this debate is. It's not about, it's not about hate speech. It's about, uh, you know, all, it's about um, things that are not true or not important you know, or distracting, sort of all these varieties of, of, of fake news. Um, but not, the hateful versions of it are, are just a small, small subset. Pre press you both a bit on this issue because it seems to me to be very important and a number of questions have, have uh, alluded to it. Uh, and, and this really has to do with the fact that Silicon Valley itself has not polarized. I mean, if only there was some polarization here, one could say the same, incidentally, about universities, but there's an almost total lack of it. In fact, you have, a, as a number of questioners have pointed out, a very liberal culture. And one question comes from Isaac. Are very liberal cultures in tech companies a cause for concern? Reid? <laughs> I thought that would be a question for Peter. Uh, yeah. That's why I asked you. <laughs> um, well... Uh, Peter and I figured out we met each other in 87 in philosophy 80, uh, mind, matter, and meeting as undergraduates. And um, a kind of a classic argument that we had had was, uh, is the university's biased left and ideologically narrow-minded? And part of the um, argument that I used, and I think there's truth on both sides of this one, uh, which is the argument I'd use is actually, in fact, if you have a bunch of people who are truth seekers who all end up in a, uh, in kind of a cluster of points of view, that may be an argument for it versus an argument for bias in terms of truth seeking. And then, you know, I think one of the points that Peter made, and this is one of the things I like about having these kinds of discussions, was that uh, generally speaking, more people on the right can argue uh, the intelligent points from the point on the left than the vice versa. And I think it's an important thing for people and progressives to be able to do that. So Peter's opening remarks. If you're, if you're, if you're a village atheist in a small town in Alabama, you can probably yes. uh, argue the other side better too. So, yeah. But, uh, but the, the sort of context we're in at places like Stanford, places like Silicon Valley, it, uh, it skews very much one way. So I think, I think, yeah, I think if you're a conservative or libertarian student at Stanford, um, you will get a much better uh, political education than if you're a liberal student. I mean, if you're liberal, you're, you will just get your views reinforced, uh, and you can be in this you know, sort of epistemic closure for, for four years for the rest of your life. And, uh, and, and so I think, it is, I think it's not even good for, for, for your side when it's, it's, it's always straw manning, never steel manning. So that was the point that I was essentially building to is the, what the challenge would think within Silicon Valley is that I think that we need to have a better discourse and theory about what is a good society, um, you know, kind of what is theories of human nature and so forth and not have a fallback of a certain ideological stance. And I think that active discussion is very important. So that's one of the things I think is a problem with it. Um, the thing I think is not a problem with it is a, is a sense of, well, actually, in fact, we have a sense of uh, kind of broad social good, you know, parodied somewhat by the Silicon Valley television show in kind of good ways uh, that says, you know, like, okay, what is that future that we're building towards and that we are actually, in fact, trying to build things that will, uh, that we have an optimism that there are technologies that we can build. And this is, like, back to the, I don't think that 
people in Silicon Valley think that we're actually in stagnation and think make America great again is a problem because we're in stagnation. I think they think it's the inequality issue. And I'd say I think the thing that they learned uh, to really focus on as kind of what's going on. And I think that they say, well, sure, there's slower progress in atoms, but BITS is now infecting all of the world of atoms, everything from robots and manufacturing and everything else. And so we are seeing progress in that, as I think they counter to the, to the, to the kind of opening argument. And I think that kind of optimism about the future that may have a broad kind of liberal ideology behind it is a good thing. So that's, that's the both answer. Peter. Well, you know, there's, it's, it's, I think it's at least ambiguous. So, um, you know, if you have network effects, if you quickly get to, you know, if they're more efficient. So you can say Silicon Valley is an efficient place where you very quickly get to the truth, you quickly figure out what the right companies are, what the future is going to be. And, um, and then the downside of an overly networked context is that uh, you get bubbles, you get epistemic closure, you get the madness of crowds, and, um, and that, is, that is also a very you know, big danger in our universities and, uh, and you know, in, in these sort of networked centers of the economy. And I, th I think, uh, um, and I do, I do think, uh, and it's always hard to know, you know exactly where you where you'd draw that line. My, my own sense is that it's, uh, it's wildly on, on, on the wrong side. So the, the question about networked versus madness of crowds, you know, one way of asking this question is, um, are we sort of at the end of history, which is sort of the liberal conceit, where we know all the basic answers, we know what's right, there are few people who are retrograde, they're bad, they're gonna die soon. Um, and, um, it was the earlier characterization the same, that I was referring you're, you're, to. Well, you're making my point. You're sort of, <laughs> it's like the, a network economy is sort of like saying, hurry up and die. But, no. um, but then um, versus, are there still a lot of things that we just don't know? And, um, and therefore, um, are there a lot of topics on which um, these, uh, these debates are still open? And I think the, um, I think the, the mistake, in my, my judgment, would be that we were constantly you know, getting to um, you know, there's, there's a right answer, that, and, and, and you get to the right answer very quickly and very efficiently. You don't waste your time on things. That's the, that's the Silicon Valley conceit, and, uh, and my view would be that on, on many topics, the answers aren't, aren't clearly right. They're not clearly right on globalization. They're not clearly right on, on any of these, uh, of these issues, and so I think to get to the truth, we need a, need a broader debate um, because I think we are more wrong than we think. Here's a question from, yeah, read. So, I mean, I think, uh, just to be precise, I think there is precisely that lack in that there is the kind of cult of efficiency, and the efficiency and techno-determinism is the, the answer that should, should be there. And I think that is too simple and should include a discussion of what is a good society, human nature, and so forth. And that does need more, you know, uh, contrasting points of view. And it's not just contrasting left-right. It's actually, in fact, more historical knowledge, more philosophical knowledge, I think those kinds of things. I mean, it's, it is entertaining to be part of conversations that are things like, okay, we're just gonna upload ourselves into a robot. And you're like, well, do you know what, how do you know what that means? Like, what is that exactly? And that, that kind of thing is, I think, important. So it's kind of a cognitive diversity uh, for thinking about the good society in, in the future. Now, that being said, I think that the notion that Actually, in fact, being very optimistic, being a, look, we can go do things that are very big is, I think, actually an important thing, and I don't think is ambiguous. I want to ask Dox, just one, one point on this. So heterodoxy. I could leave, couldn't um, I? We, I, I think, <laughs> That's unusual, I, I, isn't I think, it? I think, I think there's a sense in which I would say science, philosophy, religion, these are much more important than politics. And so heterodoxy in those fields, having genuine debates in those fields, is much more important than um, a diversity in politics. But politics is simple. If you can't even have diversity of views in politics, that's telling you you're in an incredibly unhealthy society. If that's, that's sort of where you know, the average person um, is able to engage in political debates. We don't expect them you know, to engage in these other debates. But it would be good if, they, if people could engage in these debates more. But if you can't even engage in a political debate, if you can't even um, have different views on that. That means you have um, you have no diversity of views on all these other topics, which I think are much more important. And clearly, it's been heterodox thinkers in those other fields that have been the pioneers. Uh, the pioneers, certainly in fields 
of science and philosophy in the 18th century were not uh, surrounded by like-minded people. Well, they were yeah, very I think there's, often a, there's a very big difference between good science and great science. And um, I think the good, the good version that um, you sort of get taught in a programmatic way is, is somehow you know, connecting the dots and just you know, um, copying things that other people have done. And, uh, and I think the, the great science always has, has this much more heterodox feel to it. So Jorge has asked a really nice question, uh, which goes to your friendship. I, I don't think we need to ask a question about what you think of Trump's first year to establish that you have different political views. A number of people wanted me to ask that. But I, 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 you know what? I think it's kind of obvious you're not going to give the same answer to that question. But Jorge's question is this. How much of your friendship is attributed to the fact that you met in the benign environment of the university and would you still become friends if you met today? <laughs> Reed. Um, that's a very good question. Um, the, I think if we had the context to discover the thing that we did discover at Stanford, which is it's, the truth is very important, discourse is very important, uh, uh, broadening your thinking by uh, talking to super intelligent people who disagree with you, um, is, is valuable and that the, the question is really a discourse about what is the, what is the aspirations of humanity? What are the, uh, what are the way to try to get to the better version of ourselves? Which is the, essentially a lot of the different forms of arguments that Peter and I had. If we, if we could have those discussions and discover that attribute about each other, then I think the answer would be yes now. Um, obviously part of the challenge is in the the fact that I kind of uh, worry about the current state of the Republic as kind of the, the decline of Rome uh, as a way of doing it, would we be able to see to those virtues in this? That would be, that would be the challenge. But I, I think that if we could see that, it's not so much the benevolent as much as discovering that importance of truth, that importance of what is the best, most, the, the way that we can... Uh, evolve our humanity the best, then I think the answer would be yes. Peter, you, your views when you were an undergraduate certainly weren't his on a whole range of issues, and yet you were friends. In fact, you were describing to me in the green room campaigning for the students' union together. Talk a bit about that relationship, which somehow could transcend fundamental differences of political ideology. Um, well, I th look, I think, I think we've you know, alluded to this already in many different ways tonight. Uh, it, uh, it, it is that, uh, that there, there is there are sort of a lot of open questions, a lot of things uh, to try to figure out. It is, uh, it is that you learn by, um, by understanding the other side's arguments at their strongest, not, not at, their, at, the, at their weakest. Uh, I, 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 do, I do think, um, you know, I, I, can't, I can't answer your question counterfactually, would we still become friends? That's, that's like an almost insane counterfactual question. I think. Uh, <laughs> I like this. Um, <laughs> But that would be, you know, I, I think that uh, I think there is probably uh, something about um, the time when you're at Stanford where um, it is it is a little bit easier to do this than um, than um, than uh, than than, uh, than later, and so it is it's definitely an opportunity uh, people should not miss out on. You know, sort of the, the you know the sort of your reads networking point, but the, the networks I think are always the wrong words. The better word are things like friendships, uh, things like that, uh, and. This is a good time to make uh, to build real friendships. I think the more succinct way of putting it is the time to understand each other. That was the thing. It wasn't a benevolent environment. It was the time to understand each other, and that was very valuable. We're getting uh, towards the, the close. I've, I've got a question here from Natalie, which I think is, is a, a good one to point us towards a conclusion. As discussed tonight, she says, Silicon Valley is out of touch with large swaths of the United States. What do you both think is the path forward to reconnect with people? Reed, are you going to go on one of those tours of 50 states? <laughs> <laughs> Meet people in Wisconsin? Um, look, I think that the, while, uh, and that's very funny to put it that way, look, I think that it was, um, I think those tours were very well intended because if you say, look, how do I understand people? Let me go at least talk to some of them. Let me meet people. Um, I mean, I, I think that go have the conversation is extremely important. I think that the, um, 
I think it's somewhat challenging. I mean, I think the thing is, is the problem has been brought to the mind. Like, there's a sense in which all of the uh, geekiness and nerdiness of Silicon Valley also means that Silicon Valley is a little less kind of socially adept, a little less like, okay, how do we have this uh, conversation uh, as a as a tribe or something? And so, I think the I think that probably the bridge is understanding what those challenges are and then approaching it somewhat like engineering about how do we build solutions. Um, and I think that can be helpful. That was a little bit of the reason why the kinds of things I gesture to are there are products that come out of Silicon Valley that say, actually, in fact, this can help people uh, build meaning and businesses and work and generate economics into their lives. Those kinds of things. And in can we create kind of a growth psychology, not just for our industry, but for other industries as well, those kinds of things I think can create a lot of value and can bridge that, uh, bridge the current gap. Peter, you were an outlier in 2016 in Silicon Valley. How did you manage to establish that connection with the rest of the country, with the flyover states, middle America, whatever you want to call it? It doesn't look like you're obviously connected to people in rural Wisconsin, and yet somehow you picked up that signal of deep frustration with the status quo. Tell us a bit about how you, how you did that. Well, I had been making the stagnation argument that I uh, tried to outline here for, you know, for the better part of a decade. And, uh, and I, you know, it's, 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 it, it, you sort of get enormous pushback uh, in, in Silicon Valley. Part of it is for good reasons. Part are sort of more reasons that people, um, you know, want to think they're, everything they're doing is, is, is great. Um, and so, uh, if, if this was this was an axis that uh, that was that was uh, that was that was very important, um, it was one that was there was, there was going to be a very big blind spot. Um, you know, the the advice that I'd given all the I'm more on the Republican side, but the advice I'd given all the candidates was um, they needed to have someone who was more pessimistic. They were not pessimistic enough, and you needed to be pessimistic because if you were optimistic, that just showed you were out of touch. And optimism may be a good trait. If you're a tech entrepreneur, it's um, and it's you know a somewhat good trait as a politician, but uh, too optimistic is toxic. I, you know, I, and um, and uh, this was this was the core mistake. You know, people like Romney made, people like Jeb Bush made. They think it's fundamentally um, a progressive uh, narrative where things are fundamentally working. Um, you know, I always thought it was very difficult to run a candidate who was sufficiently pessimistic because if you're too pessimistic, you'll demotivate your own voters. You know, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. That's not a that encouraging um, uh, political frame. But if there was if there was some way to be both extremely pessimistic and motivational, that was a that was a super powerful combination that I think uh, people were um, were very much under underestimating. Um, you know, I think the question I would I'd want to leave for people here is to come back to this question of the nature of scientific and technological progress. It's a question that's, uh, I think, an all-important cultural, social, political question. What is the truth about it? Are we, are we in fact, in a society that's, with a few rare, a few signal, signal exceptions, broadly stagnating? Um, you know, are the economists right? There's no productivity gains? Or, or is the sort of Google propaganda uh, the, the, the more uh, correct view of, of the world? And that's, that's, a, that's a question that I think uh, we should try to engage with. It's very hard to engage with, by the way, because it's the nature of late modernity that um, science and technology are specialized. They're the domain of specialized experts. And so we are told that you can't think about this. It's not like the 18th century where a well-educated person understood something about everything. And so is physics progressing? Is, is string theory representing a lot of progress in physics? Answer, don't know. Is quantum, are quantum computers around the corner, don't know about that either. And, uh, and when the answer to every single one of these questions is, we don't know, this all important question about um, the nature of the progress of our society, uh, we have a sort of learned helplessness with respect to it. We have to figure out some way to be able to, to think about these things more effectively. The, um, and I'm not gonna try to go into you know, every single one of those topics right now. <laughs> That's a but, relief, because we only have one minute left. But, um, <laughs> but, the, um, but the, uh, the, the, the political, the political layer on it is that I suspect that the extreme specialization leads to an incentive in which 
the experts in each of their designated fields are self-congratulatory. And so the string theorists will talk about how wonderful they are. You know, the cancer researchers will say, you know, we're about to cure cancer, it's just around the corner. Yeah, you know, that's what we've been saying for the last 50 years, but this time we're telling you the truth. And on and on uh, down the line. And you know, there's a tech version, there's a venture capital version of this where people are, are really guilty. Um, and so I think the extreme specialization, I suspect, leads to a, a massive systematic skew uh, to the answer. So, well, this so by the way, I broadly agree on the importance of being future-oriented, of saying, look, how do we have as much science progress as possible? I would say, in the since we have extremely short time, the fact that we are we today have apps on our cell phone that can recognize skin cancer that can be present for seven billion people is actually, in fact, a sign of progress. I prefer having a cure for cancer. We're working on it. It seems uh, like the moment has come to draw this wonderful conversation uh, to a close. Our next cardinal conversation, segueing rather nicely from. Uh, what Peter was uh, just talking about will take place at, in the same place at the same time on February the 22nd and will feature Francis Fukuyama and Charles Murray discussing populism and inequality. It only remains for me to do some very quick thank yous. I want to thank Hoover's amazing event staff, Alexander Bradley, Chris Dad, Denise Elson, uh, Shanna Farley, Linda Hernandez, Jeff Jones, Justin Petty, Janet Smith, and Erin Tillman, as well as Magdalena Fittipaldi at FSI. Big thank you to the students who made this happen. Stephanie Chen, uh, Carl Kinney, Christos Macridis, Anna Mitchell, Justice Tension Palmer, Ravi Jakes, Antigone Zinopoulos, and uh, Rory Arietta Kenner. However, the biggest thank you, and you're going to give it, should be for our extraordinary guests in this first Cardinal Conversation. Please join me in thanking Reid Hoffman and Peter Thiel. Thank you. Thank you.